Hello everyone, this is Pastor Andrew Thompson, and welcome to the Rooted Right Ministries YouTube page. My wife Christine and I were obedient and blessed to start Rooted Right Ministries out of our home in October of 2021. I pray that these messages will be life-changing to you and help guide you into a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning, everyone. Great to be in the house of the Lord with everybody this morning. Our hearts are heavy uh, this morning, as we did. Said to heaven, the Lord took grace to be home. And so we're mourning with our dear brothers and sisters that are left here on earth, especially their family, but we're all connected to them in some way. And so as we mourn in the natural, I, I know that we're actually rejoicing in the spirit. And I pray that the celebration that we're feeling inside, the memories that she left, the connections that were made, the relationships that were formed while Grace was here on earth. The Lord used her mightily. And we heard it week after week after week from Tim and Kathy and all those that were associated uh, with Grace in her life. And so I just want to thank the Lord this morning for his provision and for the time that was allowed here, 14 years when it could have predicted to be 14 days. It's just an absolute miracle. And the impact that she left. And so we do lift up uh, the Brzezinski family, and uh, they're part of our family too as well, the Rooted Right family. And we've grown very close to that, to Tim and Kathy, but also that whole family. And so keep them in your, on your mind today and uh, lift them up periodically throughout the day. And, uh, but I'm rejoicing this morning, even though I'm still sad that she's gone from earth, but into eternal life. So praise the Lord. That's what we have to look forward to. Well, we've been hanging out in James, and so if you missed last week, I do encourage you. It's a tough book. It's a tough, it's a convicting book. Uh, James is a very straightforward uh, book. Gets right to the point. Pulls no punches. And I encourage you to listen to that if you weren't able to be with us last week and kind of get caught up. We did James 1 last week, and the signature scripture from last week was James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So let's not just be hearers of the word, let's be doers of the word. And that was the theme. And one of the major words that we looked at was consider. And consider means to think about and be drawn toward a course of action. And that's going to be a lot. What we unpack today is what is our course of action with our faith? Let's consider today's passage of Scripture, an opportunity to exercise our faith and an opportunity to trust God on a deeper level. So today we're going to hang out with James 2. I'm going to read the full chapter before we get started. James 2. My brothers and sisters, believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Believers in our Lord, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. We've all heard that one. You are doing right. Verse 9. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of the law. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. 
speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Verse 14, and this is where we're going to hang out most today. Faith and deeds. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Verse 19, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. My, wouldn't that be something? Be called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave the lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The word of the Lord. So while I was studying this week, I ran across this story, and I think it reminded me of James. There is an amazing story of Charles Blondin. He's a famous French tightrope walker. And it's a wonderful illustration of what true faith, true faith really is. Blondin's greatest fame came on September 14, 1860, when he became the first person to cross a tightrope stretched 11,000 feet over a quarter of a mile over the mighty Niagara Falls. People from both Canada's side and the American side came from miles away to see this great feat. He walked 160 feet above the falls several times, each time with a different daring feat, once in a sack, once on stilts, once on a bicycle, once in the dark and blindfolded. One time he even carried a stove and cooked an omelet in the middle of the road. A large crowd gathered, and a buzz of excitement ran along both sides of the riverbank. The crowd ooed and ahed as Blondin carefully walked across, one dangerous step after another, this time pushing a wheelbarrow, holding a sack of potatoes. Then at one point, he offered up to the audience that there may be an opportunity for a volunteer, an audience participation. So upon reaching one of the sides, the crowd's applause was, loud, applause was louder and the roar of the falls. Blondin suddenly stopped and addressed his audience. Do you believe I can carry a person across this Niagara Falls in a wheelbarrow? The crowd enthusiastically yelled, Yes, you are the greatest tightrope walker in the world. We believe. We believe. Okay, said Blondin. Who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? As far as the story goes, no one did at that time. This unique story illustrates a real life picture of what faith actually is. The crowd watched all these daring feats. They said they believed, but their actions proved they truly did not believe. Similarly, it is one thing for us to say we believe in God. However, it is true faith when our actions line up with what we believe and put our faith and trust in His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now that story hit me because I started thinking about James. James is a half-brother of Jesus and the only reason he's the half-brother is because they have the same mother, Mary. Mary and Joseph had more than one child. And remember, 
Mary was conceived by the Holy or Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So that's why he's the half brother, which means that he grew up with Jesus. He saw from very birth the life of Jesus. And I got thinking about that. Maybe this James story. Have you ever been a part of something and, and maybe not acted on something that you've seen, just like we heard about that amazing tightrope walker? Have you ever done the do as I say, don't do as I do thing, where you really don't want others to walk down the same path as you? I wonder, after James, seeing Jesus live his life right in front of him, all the miracles that he saw happening right in front of him. I wonder if he's not so stern and kind of tough and convicting and very straightforward to the point. Because after seeing miracle after miracle after miracle, it said that James didn't actually become a follower of Jesus until after his resurrection. So that means that not only did he watch him grow up, not only did he watch him live a sinless life, not only did he watch miracle after miracle after miracle, and in fact, at one point it talks in the word that he actually uh, thought that his brother was crazy just like the rest of them. But Jesus came and visited James after the resurrection. And James had a turning of his heart. And so maybe instead of this being a contradicting book, which some people want to call it as I studied this week, I think that it goes against Paul, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Maybe he's giving you a little glimpse into his life, wishing that he would have been living for Christ his whole life and believing what was happening right in front of his very eyes, and that he would have activated his faith earlier in life. Some people say that this word in James actually contradicts itself from Paul's version where in his epistles, epistles, he shows us that salvation is not found in works, but is received through faith alone. The argument or spiritual trip up or the splitting of theological hairs perhaps could lead us to a middle ground that is merely showing us that one cannot exist without the other. Faith without works. Your works is not an obligation it's actually an honor. In Titus 3 and 5, it says he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of the rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, that shows us that we're not measuring ourselves against the person sitting next to us. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. You're not comparing, well, I, I serve this many weeks, Lord, compared to the person sitting next to me, so look at me. No one can boast of that. Jesus did all the work for us. When he sat on the cross, it is finished. If you're taking notes, whether you're here or online, you're going to want to write this down. And it's great that it was my brother Tim, who's obviously grieving right now, but it was a great conversation that him and I had this week. And he said that he'll never forget about a year ago, and this actually came many times in our conversations with Pastor Clarence in the morning. But we want we said, what is on the other side of obedience? And so you want to write down what is on the other side of your obedience. I would say that most of us know through the course of our lives what has happened on the other side of disobedience. But I want you to look at do you really know what happens on the other side of your obedience to Christ? And I think for the first time in my life, instead of and I don't want to say that you're doing this on purpose. Nobody does this stuff on purpose. We're kind of all in this thing together. So this is a very convicting message for me as well. 
But it's like I finally put my faith into practice and I stopped playing with the Word of God. Applying it every once in a while when it's convenient for me, depending on the environment I found myself in, depending on who was around me at the time, that I might say something or I might act like a Christian, or if it wasn't the right timing, I might just back away. Okay? So I know we don't purposely wake up in the morning and say, I'm just going to play with the things of God. I'm just going to play with the Word. Maybe I will, and maybe I won't. I understand your heart many times wants to serve God, but many times we're not obedient in the moment. And so what is actually on the other side of your obedience? Do you know? Could you answer that question if I sat down with you? Or forget about me. You have that conversation with the Lord. And I truly started asking the Lord, not only what is on the other side of obedience, but what does it mean that is better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere? The world has all these things to offer, these shiny things that are all in front of me, and a few, I've done it before, these, these flesh-satisfying, momentary satisfaction moments. What does it mean that's better with one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere? So faith versus works. I would submit that one cannot exist without the other. And one, God is a God of order. One works in order with the other. It is the job of the Holy Spirit to guide and direct that. And if you truly are being led and asking the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct your thoughts, your words, and deeds, and that is how you want to live your life, then the Holy Spirit will be convicting you in certain areas for works. I can promise you that the Lord just didn't want you to get to the place where you said you were saved, where you gave your life over to the Lord. It was at that moment, I, I always view it like this. I was on my way to hell before I gave my life over to the Lord, and when I gave my life over to the Lord, that got me at ground zero. And now God can actually start using me. But many of us think that that's the final product. I gave my life to the Lord, boom, I'm done. That's good. I said the sinner's prayer, I know that I gave the Lord my heart, and I have faith in God. That is just the beginning of God wanting to use you. And so that's the role of the Holy Spirit. So if you're ever around somebody that says, well, I, I never really feel convicted, chances are you're not a believer. I know that I feel convicted every day. There's, you are the clay on the potter's wheel. There's little things that God is sifting through your heart and your mind and showing you. He keeps refining you. I know that when I fell into being entrapped in sin, there was a man in my life that challenged me. And he actually challenged, this was after I did Bible studies with him. This is after we ran Christian baseball camps. We pray in the morning. We talk about, we, we were teaching. I ran Christian baseball camps. Great Christian brothers. This guy actually, and I'm going to tell you this in a completely loving way, he actually submitted. I'm not even sure that you're saved or that you're a follower of Jesus Christ with some of the decisions that you're making. And I could either take that as judgment and condemnation, or I could take that as love. You know why that guy said that to me? He had walked through the things that I was about, the decisions that I had just made. He had walked through those things for the last 12 years. So could you imagine the depth of what he was saying to me? He was about to watch me walk down the exact same hurt and pain. And he was telling me, do you really even have a relationship with Jesus Christ if you're willing to make these decisions? That wasn't for me to prove to him that I did. It was for me to ask myself between me and God. The role of the Holy Spirit is to convict us. Look what it says in Matthew 7, 15 and 16. It talks about false prophets. Watch out for false prophets. They can come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? You can talk all day long about your walk with the Lord, but if we don't see fruit, 
Matthew 7, 21 says this also. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22 says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Verse 23, Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That's that whole thing, is we can talk a good game. We can even know the right things to say. We can even know what the Word says. People know what to say and how to be religious. And God can say, depart from me. I never knew you. What does that mean? I never knew your heart. You never truly gave me your life. You knew of me. You knew about me. You actually even knew my word. And yet you never truly surrendered. That's only between you and God. You know whether you're saying one thing and living another. God knows our heart. He knows our motives. And he can see right through our facade. The proof and the reality of our faith is that we actually have a changed life. And so when I challenged you the last couple of weeks, since we're about halfway through the year, a little more than halfway, if you have those spiritual resolutions, that word or words or phrases that you said that the Lord laid upon your heart in January that you were going to try and live out this year, where are you at with that? If somebody sat down with you in January and then went on vacation for six months and came back, would they see, hear, and feel a different person in front of them? Somebody with a renewed mind. John 15, 4 through 8 says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. That's a promise right there. Apart from me, you can't do nothing. Verse 6, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done. People take advantage of scriptures like that. Ask whatever you wish, and if it is in the Lord's will for your life, and it lines up with his word, it will be done. Some of you were praying for that billion-dollar lottery last week. If it lines up with God's will, and it lines up with his word, it will be done for you. And it's going to be on God's timing. Verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Is it possible to have proof of my faith and my relationship with God by the way I live? We live our lives. There's three ways to describe your faith. Two of them, I don't, we don't want to land in these categories. And it talks about it all throughout James 2. There's three ways to describe our faith. Number one, there's dead faith. James 2.14 in the Greek language, when something is mentioned more than once in the Bible, it means that it's of great importance, and there's a lot of emphasis on that. James 2 says, faith without works is dead, and it's mentioned in verse 14, in verse 17, in verse 20, and verse 26. So when you read those verses, I want you to ask, ask yourself, in each situation, in each conversation, what does a Christ likeness look like in each situation. I don't know about you, but when I get done with the day, we all sin and fall short of his glory. There's many times daily that I say to myself, what could I have done differently there, Lord? When we have that cliche about what would Jesus do whenever you're wearing that bracelet, what really would Jesus have wanted you to do in that scenario, in that environment, in that conversation? And you know what? He's going to give you another chance. And it's our recognition that we missed an opportunity to share the love of Christ with somebody else. In 1 John 2, 4 through 6, it says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. 
Verse 5, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Verse 6, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So Jesus is our example. We're not comparing ourselves to anybody else. We're not comparing ourselves to another believer. We're certainly not comparing ourselves to non-believers. Jesus is our example. That is the benchmark, and no one can live up to what he did. We all know that. That's why we needed him, to die on the cross and to pay the price for us. That's why it's so much more than works. That's why it's faith and works. People should be able to see a life change in you. Look what it says in James 2, verse 15 through 17. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So I got thinking about this. Uh, this is, this is a, 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 I'm sure it's been common all through time because there's nothing new under the sun. But I noticed that the media likes to grab this thing about, oh, I'm so tired of hearing thoughts and prayers. My thoughts and prayers are with you. And I thought, what a lie from the enemy. I mean, first of all, it depends on what kind of thoughts. If you're applying godly thoughts, and you're applying godly principles, and you're speaking the word of God in the situation, but you see, this is where the thoughts and prayers ring hollow. When it just comes out of your mouth that I'll be praying for you, I'll be thinking about you, and that we actually don't do it in any way. I, I just thought about this. I won't throw out any news channels, but you can fill in the blanks yourself. After you're hearing this tragic story unfold, and you're trying to do your best as a reporter to just pull out every little emotion, and you've got somebody crying on the other end because of the impact that it's had on their lives, and then you say, we're thinking about you. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. And you click off because you got everybody to watch their great emotion. Could you imagine that news reporter stopping right there and actually praying? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that you would touch this family right now. You know what they're hurting. And just go, and all of a sudden speaking the word. I mean, could you imagine that? That you don't have to say thoughts and prayers if you do thoughts and prayers. So, when God convicts us to say thoughts and prayers, when God convicts us to walk in a, the steps of a good man and woman are ordered by the Lord. So if you happen to have somebody in front of you that you know God is telling you to help, to be there for them, to talk to them, to buy a meal for them, I'm not saying you're going to go through and just be searching out for You can't help everybody understand. There's this constant thing, and I know it's a struggle, especially amongst, amongst Christians. You're like, well, I don't know, I feel like Maybe I should help that person. Maybe I, and you feel almost like you're, you're, you're double-minded, just like it talks in James. Who should I help? When should I help? Honestly, bring it to the Lord in prayer. And if the Lord convicts your heart, and you know in your heart that that is an area you're called to, I think it goes back to Romans, where it talks about all the different gifts that we've all been given. There's a reason why you're passionate about something in your life. And when you tell me about it, I might not be quite as passionate about you. It doesn't mean I don't care doesn't mean I don't have a heart for that overall as a Christian and somebody that loves all people. But that might not be what I'm called to do. If you ask me what I'm called to do, I'm called to men, for sure. I've been part of men, men's lives my whole life on teams. I've seen what God has done where men get together and pray and believe God on behalf of their family and, and come and stand in the gap for one another and bear one another's burdens. And I know deep down inside that I'm called to men. We're also called to marriages. Look at the testimony that God has put in our mouth. And then I love that God and we want to begin to start a church. We're called to all of those. Okay? So I'm sure there's many things, lists that you could say, well, I didn't hear this, I didn't hear that, I didn't hear that. Does that mean that rooted right ministries won't have all of those things that you just said, said in your mind that I didn't hear? No. Oh. That means that God's going to bring those that are passionate about that, and we come alongside them with our faith, with our support, with our belief, with our trust in God, and we all start doing what God has called us to do. So not only do you have true faith, but you also have an effect on those that you speak to. So you look at what happened in that verse 17. 
you come upon somebody that's hungry that doesn't have any clothes, and you say, oh, be blessed. Hey, I, I pray that you get some food and everything's taken care of. Have a, have a blessed day, and you walk away. Okay. So just think of the representation we are for Christ when we do that. So we're not only having an impact on our, on our own walk, on our own action of faith, but we're having an impact on those that come along our path. Number two, there's demonic faith. This one kind of hurts too. James 2, 18 and 19, but someone will say, you have faith, but I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good, but even the demons believe that. And they shudder. I'm not even sure. Sometimes Christians shudder. Because we say that we're in Christ. We say that we've given our lives over to the Lord. We say that we're justified by our faith. Recognizing the right things or the things of God doesn't mean anything. Even the demons know the truth. Even the demons have a really good grasp on theology. Mark 134. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Luke 4, 33 and 34. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out, cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Luke 4, 41. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. They know the truth and they know who God is. And in fact, many times they'll use half-truths to wrap a lie around that to get you off the path of where God's taking you. And that's why it's so important that we know the Word of God, that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you have an affection for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? A relationship, not just facts. You don't just know of our Lord and Savior. And then we get to number three, the good one, the category we all want to fall into. This is demonstrated faith. This is verses 20 through 26. Let's read those and get those in our spirit. This is how we want to live our lives. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. So maybe our faith is not complete yet. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see, that person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did and when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off to a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead as well. So James covered the whole gamut there, by the way. And I think this goes back to the beginning of James 2, talks about not showing favoritism. I also think that it shows the heart of God as well. There was one, he's talking about Abraham, the father of our faith. And then we go all the way, everybody in between, to Rahab, the prostitute. And both of them are in the hall of faith. But why are they in the Hebrews' hall of faith? It was the action that followed their faith. So God is building you up. He's filling you with his word. He's showing you his truth. He's proving time and time again who he is in your life. And it's been a benefit to you. But there comes that point in time when you realize he's built you up for such a time as this and not just for you. He wants to use you. By faith is said 14 times in the Hall of Faith, and it's before all those that, that you can read about. I, I encourage you to go to Hebrews, read about all of those that are in the Hall of Faith. But every time before I explain what they did, it was by faith. 
by faith, by faith. So dead belief has no power. No faith, no power. No faith, no works. We are seed planting every single day. And your seeds, if they're rooted in faith and grounded in the word, will produce fruit. The fruit does not save you. So the fact that my wife's tree has tons of fruit on it, and somebody else's tree has one little budding fruit on it, and you're not saved by the amount of fruit. It proves that you actually believe and activated the faith inside of you. So the fruit didn't save you. Your faith in God saved you. I kind of like this, the justification thing. I heard it explained like this this week. Because you've got the Paul on one side, and people want to argue that James is on this completely different path, and I believe that they work together. Your justification before and after the cross. You're justified before being saved by faith and by what Jesus did for us on the cross. But after you've given your life over to the Lord and salvation, justification on the other side of salvation comes from works and validating what God is asking us to do. So you have that paradigm shift. Before you could not do anything to save yourself, God did it for us. And then after, you're acknowledging, even by giving your life over to the Lord, that the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And then I want to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Obedience. Using what God has done for us to impact others. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 again. It's for by for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork. Verse 10. Created in Jesus Christ to do good works. There it is right there. No one can boast about the works. And it's not by works that we're saved, but created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance. Ooh, that's a good one. Wow. I just hit him right there. I didn't even see that until now. God already prepared us in advance to do the work that he's calling us to do, but he was waiting for our heart and mind to be given over to him to activate it. And we still have the free will. We have the choice of whether or not we want to do what God is asking us to do. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So what has God done that has changed you? If I threw the mic to you right now, could you come up here and testify and what God has done and how he's renewed your mind and how you're a completely different person in Christ? Doesn't mean you have it all together. We just went through the whole gamut. And we all sin and fall short of his glory. We're all a work in progress. But what has God done? And what are you believing God to do? And what has he prepared you to do? Are you seeing your life as a ministry for others? This is not just for the pastor up in front of everybody preaching. And I think that's where we've gotten it so wrong in the church. Every single one of us is called to ministry. Every one of us. You might not be called to preach up in front of people. Every one of us is called to ministry. I can give you a few examples before we close here. Your faith going into action, okay? My wife's action of faith is the reason why I'm standing here preaching to you. She could have gave up a long time ago. She had a promise from the Word. She has a promise from the Holy Spirit, and she had a relationship with Christ. And all, those, they, all the things around her were saying something else. She was speaking and believing those things that are not as though they were. True faith. Same thing about, we don't need to separate that Hall of Faith group in Hebrews. You, you can be part of that. You're probably not going to get a book in the Bible. 
but he, he wants to use you on, here, on earth right now as an example of how you put your faith into action. And then he puts a testimony in your mouth. We're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Okay? So my wife's action of faith is why we are still married, is why I am standing in front of you today, and is why Rooted Right Ministries even exists. My accountability partner, Clarence, his action of faith was to pick up a phone and call somebody that God laid on his heart that for some reason was a burden. Day after day after day, I need to call, I need to call, I need to call. Now, it took a long time, <laughs> but God's timing is the perfect timing. 13 years before he actually picked up the phone, and he said he thought of me every year, but almost daily for the last three months before he actually made the call. Okay? So it's amazing how God doesn't give up on us, and we've all had seen that throughout the years. Thank God the Lord didn't give up on me and did not forget about me. And so Clarence's action of faith was to make a call. Now, because of his action of faith, never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that one, my whole life would be restored, marriage, family, ministry, but also a book was birthed out of Clarence's action of faith. But that's only part of it. Then I had to believe. Do you know I wanted to write a book so long ago? That thing was sitting inside of me, and the enemy wanted so bad not for it to come, for it not to come out. And when you start to recognize the longevity of how long it's been since you haven't done what God's asked you to do, that shows you the power behind it. There's a reason why I'm trying to get you not to do it. And so I almost went to the grave without this book being written. I wanted to write a book when I was going to college after I got done playing professional baseball. And I even had a professor out of the blue walk up to me, out of the blue, and goes, you want to write a book, don't you? I'm like, yeah, I do. And I kept waiting until I had everything all together before I was going to write it. Isn't that another lie from the enemy? And so my action of faith was to actually believe that there was a book inside of me. And because I set that in motion, that testimony remains to be seen as it comes out and the impact that that may have on people's lives. So when you get your mind off of yourself and you just are obedient to what God is asking you to do, have that true conversation this week. Lord, what is on the other side of the obedience? And truly ask that to him. What are you being asked to do? And I sure know what's on the other side of disobedience. But Lord, for once in my life, I want to see what's on the other side of obedience. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing in this room right now. Lord, there's so many books that haven't been written, businesses that haven't started, ministries that are hidden inside of us, relationships that need to be restored. Father, we know that it's not only by works. We know that it starts with our faith in you. But Lord, we know there's an action item that you're asking us to do. Father, let us not just walk through this life with knowledge of your word and what you could do or what you have done, what your word promises. Lord, even the enemy knows all about you. Let us put our faith into practice on a daily basis and let's get our mind off of this big, grandiose, final thing that we think that you're trying to do. Sometimes you give us a glimpse of where you're taking us but it's the little steps along the way that we're missing. So Father, when we wake up every morning and we ask for your guidance, your leadership, your direction, we ask that the Holy Spirit's voice speaks the loudest over anything else that's clamoring for our attention. Father, help us to be obedient in those moments. Lord, let us be our faith instead of just talk about our faith. Let Rooted Right, those that have been a part of Rooted Right, continue to get built up Lord, we know you've already, what you've done for us on the cross. You've already completed it all. You've already given us the provision to do everything that you're asking us to do. And Lord, we thank you in advance that you're putting a testimony in our mouths daily. We don't have to have all the answers, Lord, because you do. 
We have to submit and surrender to the call of God in our lives. There's ministry in every one of us. And Lord, we know that there's hurting people all around us every single day. Lord, help us to bear one another's burdens. Help us to get our minds off of ourselves. Push self down so that you may rise, Lord. Holy Spirit, have your way in the lives of each and every person that's represented in this room and all those that will listen online. And Lord, let us see what's on the other side of our obedience. Many times, it's people's lives. It's eternal life. It's getting victory over addictions. It's restoring relationships. It's helping marriages out. It's dealing with financial issues. Lord, you know all the things that we're facing here on this earth. And Father, your word addresses them all. There's nothing new under the sun. And so that we can be equipped each and every day as we go forward to get victory in Christ. Father, we give all these things over to you and we count them all done. We thank you in advance for the testimonies that will flow out of the mouths of the people that are under the sound of my voice. Those that are diving deep into the word to see what you have to say about it, to get you involved and to get eternal perspective. Lord, we don't want man's perspective. We want God's perspective. Father, we honor you today. Lord, please take control of our thoughts, take control of our actions. Let each and everything that we do be glorified unto you. And when we don't, it's okay that it's convicting. It shows that we even have a relationship with you. It's the job of the Holy Spirit. Help us to repent, turn back towards the things of God instead of running away from the things of God, and watch us get victory day after day after day, conversation after conversation, thought after thought. Lord, we give all these things over to you and count them all done. In Jesus' name.